if social critique is the primary mode of the Enlightenment, then satire is probably its most uh, natural artistic representation. And in that, you really can't get much better than Jonathan Swift. Swift's A Modest Proposal as a essay ran in a, uh, ran in a newspaper and he used this, uh, this forum of intellectual debate to uh, engage in one of the, uh, on the surface, one of the primary issues of the country where he was at the time, which was Dublin. He was an Irishman who worked for the, uh, the British government for off and on for quite a while. And uh, that sense of being a bit of an outsider, a bit of a, uh, a misfit, so to speak, as an Englishman in Ireland, as an, Ir as an Irishman in England, uh, gave him a remarkable perspective and ability to see um, critical lapses in society. And he wrote about... Um, population problem and poverty in Ireland, a problem that has lasted for quite some time. And uh, he, uh, he took his, uh, he took a crack at it as an intellectual. And he, in it, he is somewhat sending up uh, a, a long tradition of uh, social critique of thinking in very um, abstract terms. And in, uh, in this particular, he is sending up to a degree the notion of enlightenment thought in itself, the, that you can get sort of swept away by your own uh, ability to reason. Reason can lead you to many uh, many conclusions that perhaps uh, would be better tempered by a certain morality. And of course, the Enlightenment uh, view would be that, well, reason is all we need. Morality is kind of made up. Uh, we should be able to think. And Swift here is saying, okay, let's, uh, let's pump the brakes on that. Uh, your ability to reason can lead you astray. And he demonstrates that in a modest proposal, which begins in a, uh, a very objective uh, uh, pose. You know, it is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town, which is Dublin for him, or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads, the cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children all in rags and importuning every passenger for an alms. Oh, you know, uh, overpopulation and poverty, they bedevil many societies. And he was just saying, oh, it's just a shame that we have to see this. From this perspective, he's saying that, you know, for nice people walking around, it's just, oh, yeah, those people. And there's a little bit of that stuffiness in there. And he's putting that out there at the beginning. And he starts into his topic in a very officious and academic uh, perspective and tossing out little references here and there, little word choices that suggest where he's coming from with this when he talks about, you know, uh, when he talks about, um, I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious number of children in the arms, on the backs, on the heels of their mothers, and frequently their fathers, is, in the present deplorable state of the kingdom, a very great additional grievance. And therefore, whoever could find out a fair, cheap, and easy method of making these children sound and useful, useful, suggests utilitarianism, a burgeoning theory of um, uh, everything has to be useful and that's how you justify it irrespective of moral considerations 
uh, these children sound and useful members of the Commonwealth would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. A little grandiose there. Uh, but again, still looking at uh, children primarily as a problem to be solved. Hmm. What to do? Uh, and he continues on in this vein. Uh, you know, uh, as to my own part, having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject and maturely weighed the several schemes of their projectors, economists essentially, social scientists who are working in this, I have always found them grossly mistaken in their computation. Again, a simple matter of addition and mathematics. Uh, their computation seems off, and that's what's bothering him. Uh, and these are uh, early social scientists who are looking and trying to figure out uh, how to predict what society is going to look like and where it is going and how we can deal with it and what are the problems and how can we deal with the problems on a mathematical, reasonable basis. Uh, and, and he leads into this, and it's all kind of general and vague and very academic, and he's just sort of sidling up. He seems to have something on his mind, and he's getting there very slowly and pedantically. Um, in a way, he's, he's borrowing a page from, from Montaigne's ability to just sort of weave his way. He doesn't declare anything right at the beginning. He has to warm up to it a little. And he brings you along in that process until finally he gets there. I shall now therefore humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. Um, <laughs> I have been assured by a very knowing American Swift did not like Americans. By a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London, associating himself with London there, um, anti-Irish, that a young, healthy child, well-nursed, is, at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled. And I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragu. <laughs> so his proposal for the problem of overpopulation uh, and poverty tied together is to simply eat children. Um, and, and, and he proposes this with this straight face, this simple logical conclusion that he is drawn after making all the correct computations and calculations and he's done his homework and he has thought about it and of course this is the proper conclusion to draw and it's and then he twists it even a little bit more for one more laugh um by offering up all of these straight face like ways of preparing food, stewed, roasted, baked, or, or boiled, e equally serve in a fricassee or a ragu. <laughs> Which is funny. And here, he's, he's led you through all of these uh, assumptions of uh, you know, well, how do we how do we deal with population? How do we deal with poverty and all these things? And he is sort of he is joking on again a long tradition of people proposing these things that don't really take into account human reality, uh, the humanity of their issues, uh, and and he goes through it and he shows great disdain. Uh, for the uh, for these people, for the Irish, for their Roman Catholicism, for their uh, for their simple the simple fact that they are not proper Englishmen and they are not uh, they're not wealthy uh, and and he's objectifying them quite coldly and discussing them as if they weren't even human obviously. Uh, but that, because he is 
generating this character. That suggests he is himself making himself he is making himself the object there because he is doing this in such a outrageous fashion. His idea is so off the wall and his character is at this point so offensive that that is suddenly the object of satire, the, the object of ridicule to a certain degree, because we as human beings, Irish, poor or not, are saying this person has lost it. This person is just off the wall. Everything they're saying is just horrible. And so we're no longer objectifying the Irish, we're objectifying the English intelligentsia and the social scientists and the enlightenment rationalists who are always thinking up this ways to improve society that are horrible when you actually think about putting them into practice. But he keeps it up and he lays out a case very rigorously. He, he comes up and he says, I have too long digressed and therefore I shall return to my subject. And then he starts firing out the reasons. First, um, as I have already observed, it would be greatly lessen the number of papists, Roman Catholicists, with whom we are yearly overrun. Cut down the, uh, the Catholics. <laughs> Swift is laying out a case in very logical, cold, rational, lawyerly terms. This is how a lawyer speaks. First, lay out one thing. Second, lay out another. Third, make your points. You can see the bullet points. It's almost like he's doing a PowerPoint presentation. It is just so, so logical and he's so committed to this idea he's getting carried away with it almost he is just building and building and building because you can sense his uh, he's so caught up in the idea of it so enraptured with the rational uh logic that he is able to lay out he is completely blowing past all moral considerations and he, he carries this to his final appeal, his closing argument. Therefore, I repeat, let no man talk to me of these and the like expedients till he hath at least some glimpse of hope that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempts to put them into practice. That's it. The glimpse of hope that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempts to put them into hab habits or put them into practice. The notion of hope is just sort of tossed out there. I like that little perk because that's a very abstract and anti-rationalist idea, hope. The anticipation of something better. I see that as a little buried pearl in here where he's just nudging you very lightly to consider something a little different. But he doesn't drop the act. I desire those politicians who dislike my overture and may perhaps be so bold as to attempt an answer that they will first ask the parents of these mortals whether they would not at this day think it a great happiness to have been sold for food at a year old. Wouldn't they rather have been eaten? In the manner I prescribe, and thereby have avoided such a perpetual scene of misfortunes as they have since gone through, by the oppression of landlords, the impossibility of paying rent without money or trade, the want of common sustenance, with neither house nor clothes to cover them for the inclemencies of weather, and the most inevitable, inevitable prospect of entailing the light of greater miseries upon their breed forever. So there, he's unholstering the full argument. If you're going to treat them as animals anyway, which is the which is the crueler fate? We're starving them. We are providing them no sustenance. We are keeping them down in very real ways. This is a member of the British government saying this. 
uh, saying we are exploiting these people. Would they rather be eaten alive or eaten when they're dead? Which is the same thing Montaigne said in Cannibals. And the kicker at the end is kind of funny because after he brings you down to that level of recognition and moral reckoning, I profess in the sincerity of my heart that I have not the least personal interest in endeavoring to promote the necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country. By advancing our trade, providing for our infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. Pleasure to the rich? I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest being nine years old, and my wife passed childbearing. <laughs> Which is a nice little kicker. He tosses it in there for a little laugh at the end to remind you after he has made it very serious at the penultimate paragraph. Here he gives you a short one to just sort of like, yeah, but maybe I'm just kidding. Maybe I'm not. <laughs> he can play both sides of that coin because satire is supposed to be funny, but it's also supposed to have bite. And he delivers both here brilliantly. And in this, you can see him being way ahead of uh, the entire Enlightenment movement. Because it's, it's just really getting going at this point. And that notion of criticism for criticism's sake. And always thinking um, of ways to improve society is really just getting going. Uh, and the notion of population itself is going to find some uh, population analysis is going to find some fruition uh, a couple of generations later, like 75 years later, a guy named Thomas Malthus is going to publish uh, an essay on the principles of population, which does a very masterful job of analyzing society, analyzing birth rates, is as opposed to crop rates and coming to the conclusion that well pretty soon we're just going to uh, no longer be able to feed ourselves we are going to outpopulate the earth and devastation will occur and he's presenting this in very cold mathematical terms that uh, sound an awful lot like Swift's you know uh, comfortable academic The notion of reason, untempered by moral considerations, is a fault line running through the Enlightenment, where people get caught up in their ability to think and the freedom to think, and get into a habit of just poo-pooing morality and, you know, any concern that is not scientifically verifiable. And that is a troubling position to be in because you can lose sight of consequences. You can lose sight of what happens when your theory hits the real world and the unintended consequences get away from you. Swift is in his, in his heart a, uh, a conservative on this because the whole conservative movement looks at unintended consequences. You're trying to monkey around with uh, the laws of a society as they have evolved and the instinct to correct them is noble but you have to be very careful with that. You cannot just go in and start changing rules here and there and instituting new laws and new policies without thinking about them and thinking about them from many different angles including morality because reason alone can only get you so far reason alone is subject to huge blind spots because when you think you see it all that's very often when you cannot see the one thing that really matters and here Swift is trying to point out 
the one thing that really matters. When you're dealing with population, when you're dealing with children, when you're dealing with poverty, you're dealing with humanity. And missing that, missing that is too big to just brush aside as old time superstitions. Humanity is greater than the mind. 